We're going to start off by talking about assessment. That was kind of left off the plate yesterday, uh, and that's really important. What are your goals? We just, you just jump right into creating a lesson, but obviously the lesson has to fit into the larger curriculum. What are your goals? Uh, so that's what we'll be talking about in the morning. And in the afternoon, we're going to get concrete and say, OK, now if you really want to publish this, and we want you to publish this, that's the whole point. You create something for the world, and you're going to share it. What steps do you have to go through? There's some things that we haven't really even talked about. So choosing a license, putting that license on, um, making it shareable, OK? And also getting it ready for submission. There are a couple of steps in there. We want to talk to you about the editorial process, OK? So let me turn it over to Chantelle and Joanna. So in order to just kind of bring us back into um, the topic and, and the work that you've been doing, um, I'd like you just in your, even at, I guess you're sitting still in your groups from yesterday, which is perfect. So just take a few moments and with the people that, that your, your colleagues, talk about the kind of assessments that you do in your courses already that might apply to a flight lesson and also where you might see tension points. What sort of assessments might not work for a flight lesson? It doesn't have to be the lesson you're currently working on. We will be coming back to that question. But if you're not quite there at the moment, thinking more broadly is OK as well. Just in general, what kinds of assessments would apply to these kinds of lessons? All righty. Can we maybe come back together again? I'm hearing just some really interesting issues that are coming up and you know assessment has become such a uh, heavy <laughs> load uh, accountability and assessment have become uh, institutionally uh, um, foregrounded in a way that uh, it, it, it then ultimately ends ends up getting at the heart of so many issues so many things that we deal with in pedagogy tie back into well, how do we assess this what do we do how do we make this uh, accountable. Um, we were working on a um, fairy tale, and there's a good way of um, getting students to summarize. And you follow this um, rubric or guide. It's character once, but so then. So, for example, Beauty and the Beast. Um, and I can't think of it. At, so, you, you just choose any character. What does that character want? But there's something that happens to them um, that that gets you know that's in the way. So then what happens? And um, so and then afterwards you then what is the final conclusion? Right. So you're it's, following the narrative arc, but you're doing it in a way that pinpoints in in a very precise so manner. They, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they can that gives them. A, a way to start, right? So they can say, give the name of the character and use the verb want, and then go end of the sentence. Then start with, then start with but or use but in the sentence and finish the sentence. So and then finish that sentence, and then and finish that sentence. And so that would make them summarize, which higher level thinking, right? Yeah. Um, but with a guide, and at the same time, that would make them write um, their own sentences, but again, um, following the guide. Yes. So they're not, follow they're not completely on their own, you know, wondering where do I start and everything like that. And I call that for them to remember. I mean, I live in Dallas, but I don't like the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> but um, I call that Cowboys because C for character, W for want, B for but, and um, S, S at the end for so. Uh -huh. And so that helps them remember how to, I how to do Cowboys. it. I right. <laughs> um, Anyway, that's what I thought would be a nice assessment for the fairy tale. It's a nice reminder of how you even scaffold in your assessments, right? Because what you're ultimately doing is scaffolding their ability to do a recount um, by giving them this, this rubric, this framework. Yeah, right. So in talking about assessment, then we can, you know, do the backward planning and see then, of course, how things lead up to that and, and how that uh, yeah, ties in. So assessment is always a hard part mm. to, to say what you officially say to me, because mm. you're constantly assessing anyway. Sure. Um, but what I normally do is like I, I have for the 
Spanish learners. In the class, I for everybody, I've divided. I so we work by units, and um, by the end of the unit, I tell them you're going to be able to. For example, I give them the, the example of one of my units. You're going to be able to present or promote a store that you have, including clothes and prices, and so on. So that so I tell them that's the ultimate goal, and um, so when they finally when they finally are at the mom, at the point where they are presenting, um, I grade that based on a rubric. Mm -hmm. However, during the less normal lessons, everyday life, before the day of the project, um, each little part of the project that they do, I grade. So it's a combination of, um, of um, a paper, uh, um, Grading things that they produce on paper, like you know, uh, uh, the plan for the presentation or the number mm -hmm. of words mm -hmm. that the they steps. know, or the mm -hmm. blah. and also, um, and also the rubrics for the end of the thing. So I, I, I t this is all. So I tell them all this at the beginning. That I will also grade group work. I will also grade, um, you know. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I grade the little parts. So it's formative and. Um, Based on a rubric, yeah. At the beginning of the year, I use a diagnostic uh, assessment mm -hmm. to know their level, and then we have formative assessment to to uh, to see their progress. And uh, these kind of assessments can be uh, in different format. For example, they can use uh, um, they can use uh, the tasks that we have in each unit, uh, the daily questions. Actually, so in many ways, we can do the formative assessment. And at the end of each unit, or at the end of maybe three units, if we have lack of time, we can do the uh, the formative assessment. So, what kind of assessment we do? And I I think. For this kind of uh, online um, assessment, we can do the formative uh, assessment and also the uh, the diagnostic assessment at the same time. We can add also um, uh, doing assignments online or present something from their own. Uh, we can also use uh, what we call it the peer review. Mm -hmm. uh, group review, mm -hmm. they can have a group together as a student and evaluate each other. Um, um, so it depends on the tasks. Sure, yeah. sure. Do you see assessment tools that you already work with that would easily apply to a flight lesson? Or do you see that, hmm, might need different kinds of assessment and in what ways? So to make them simple uh, and also enjoyable, uh, let's say to track their attention, to not feeling boring while doing these tasks, and uh, the navigation between the whatever we have, the units online should be really easy uh, and really practical. So I think it should be easier than the real lesson and their their, I don't know, the real mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. kinds of assessment okay. that we have in the classroom. Before we actually get to examples of assessment, I did though, in based on a conversation that you were having at this table about the tie-in between spoken skills and the kind of work that we're doing here with literacies development, whether we want to call it multiple literacies, text-based, um, the flight approach, right? So, um, and then that then goes into questions of assessment further as far as um, um, spoken skills. So I did want to give you a quick example of the very uh, first lesson in my textbook. Um, so you can, I'll, I'll show it online. You can, uh, if you have the textbook with you, you could always take a look at that. But I'm going to go to the text directly because this was a text that I wrote. And it gives me the opportunity to also talk a little bit about the notion of authentic text. It's a term that we hear ubiquitously. Um, and we all seem to understand what that means. But within the context of flight and thinking about language as a semiotic system of meaning making, for me, I think we need to extend our notion of authentic to include a text that can be written by a non-native speaker for uh, students, but that encodes the literary. So a text that does not have the literary is something that I think of as, in some sense, potentially non-authentic, because the literary is in language. It's inherent in language. So for me, that, that is really a key distinction. And I'll show you um, the very first lesson 
in, in, in French and probably the same with, with Romance languages uh, and even in, in ESL. One of the first things that you address is the noun system. Of course, they don't talk about system, nouns, right? Um, and so students are learning in French about singular and plural, because nouns in French have, you know, uh, uh, have uh, um, uh, gender, right? So they have to learn masculine, feminine, singular, plural. So that's already a lot of information to be working with that, that uh, uh, is new to students. So they work with the noun, well, they work with nouns for, for a few chapters, and they don't get to adjectives until later, because adjectives involve agreement with gender and number. So that's considered more uh, complex. But that means that students are very constrained right from the start with nouns, the verb to be and nouns, and talking about classroom, uh, 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 what is in the classroom, this is a this, there's a that, and also introducing themselves. Because of um, the need to introduce themselves, they get into the structure of I am a student, right? But in French, you don't say, I am a student. You say, je suis étudiant, or je suis étudiante. I am student. In fact, that noun is used adjectivally, right? And that's presented as an anomaly. Oh, there is just, when you want to talk about uh, what someone does, uh, or the political affiliation, you know, he is Republican, she is Democrat, right? That those are the exceptions. Again, not true. Any noun can be used adjectivally, attributively, following the verb to be, in order to characterize. And so I give the example. With English, you can say Sarah is so country. Right? So country is a noun. It's acting adjectivally. And in French, if you have, for example, two students arrive in a room to study for an exam, you can say, tu es plutôt table ou bureau? Do you prefer studying at a table or a desk? And then you say, moi, je suis très table. Me, I'm very table. <laughs> it's the literal translation. But it means I'm more of a table person. I'm more into studying at a table. This is a highly productive spoken form. It's also a form that can be used in literary context, in poetry, etc. So I decided to write a little poem, which is called C'est tout un poème. Literal meaning, it's, it's a whole poem. It's all a poem. Metaphorically, that means something like in English when we say, ah, oh, it's a whole story. It means, mm, <laughs> it's a lot more complicated than what you might think, the, 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 the events that happened. So, here is language used from the very first chapter of Français Intractif. It's the most basic vocabulary that you have uh, introducing French. But I turned it into a poem with the goal of getting them to focus on nouns that are being used metaphorically. So, je vous présente Aaron. Il est étudiant en sciences politiques, mais en linguistique, il est plutôt escargot. So, uh, I'm going to ask you to give me a gloss when we get to it. So, I'd like to introduce you to Aaron. He's a student of uh, political science, but in linguistics, he's rather, now the word escargot, for those of you who don't know French, what do, do you know escargot? You've probably, you may have eaten them or seen them on the menu. Snails. So what might that mean? Il est plus, he's rather snail? Slow. Slow. Sluggish. Sluggish. Snail-like, right? Uh, dans la salle de classe, il y a un tableau, un morceau de cré et un exercice avec le verbe être, mais Aaron est très fenêtre. So in the classroom, there's a blackboard, a piece of chalk, and an exercise with the verb être, which is to be. But Aaron is very... Does anyone know what fenêtre means? Window. Window. What might that mean? Distracted. He's very distracted because he's looking out the window. He's very into being a window person, right? Meaning he's looking out the window. Aujourd'hui, on est lundi. Après, il y a la semaine et puis, samedi, dimanche, mais au, oh, le week-end, Aaron est très labo. So today is Monday. After, there's the week. And then Saturday, Sunday. But... Oh, on the weekend, Aaron is very, so labo, short for? Laboratory. Laboratory. So he's very studious, studious, industrious, right? He's working hard, 
Comment Qu'est-ce qu'il fait Ben, Aaron apprend le français. Sa nouvelle petite amie s'appelle Marie. Elle est de Paris. So, how's that? What's he doing? Well, he's learning French. His new girlfriend's name is Marie, and she is from Paris, right? So this notion of, so, you know, we get students to find these nouns that are acting adjectivally and to try to understand what these meanings are, just as I'm asking you. This is very basic sentence structure. It's the verb être. It's all of this key vocabulary that students learn in that first chapter. But it's put together in a way that is bringing out the literary. So that is something when students say, they say, uh, if they want to give a sense of themselves, and they say, uh, I don't know, je suis très chocolat, right? Right? Oh, I love chocolate. I'm really into chocolate. And someone else might say, moi, je suis très sport. I'm, I'm very into sports. I'm very athletic. It gives students right away the possibility not just to name things that are in the classroom and to say, my name is. It gives them the ability right from the start to use that same vocabulary, but adjectivally, and to go that much further in talking about, oh, this is who I am. Let me give you a sense of me as, you know, how do I characterize myself? So, and the writing assignment involves them uh, using these kinds of things to uh, describe, uh, give a, pre, uh, you know, um, uh, a description of, of themselves. So, um, so how, does, how does the literary tie into spoken language? In all ways, right? So it's a question of, once again, finding those links and making them apparent. So it, it involves thinking about language differently and, and, and uh, looking at it. Um, differently and breaking it down for students. So, Can I oh, make a second? Yes. I, I love this example <clears throat> for a lot of reasons, but one of the things that I think Joanna is bringing out here is that what we're calling the literary is obviously the creative part of language, but that grammar structure is not found in grammar books, right? right? Which is the point. Um, so standard grammar books give you the standard grammar, which is usually very normative, and it's usually based on the writing. And, but um, <clears throat> when I, I teach this at the college level, too, and our students are like, wow, I, I have finished. I'm a, a French major. I've never been taught this. I said, well, you better get ready because people use this all the time. It's highly productive, right? And so that's one of the things that we're trying to, to get across here is that there's all this creativity that's left off the radar on most commercially produced materials. So it's up to you to bring that back into the classroom. So that's also the notion of the literary is, again, this playful, creative use of language that often is not thought of as grammar. But it is. That's, that's, following, a <clears throat> that's following a grammatical paradigm. Right. Now, in the AP test, you won't see that. <laughs> Right? So, you, you, you know, it, it is sort of a judgment call about your own assessments within the context of your course. Also, of course, preparing students then for taking standardized tests that aren't going to recognize this kind of thing. However, when you work with this, one of the things that is a sticking point for uh, English speakers is that they want to always put in that article. They always want to say, you know, um, je suis une étudiante, I am a student. They make errors with that. So when you work with them so that they understand, oh, if there's no article, it's acting adjectivally. It helps them to actually gain better uh, accuracy, better command of, oh, I, I, this is, I'm using this adjectivally. OK, no article. Oh, here it's a noun. Oh, I need my, I need my article. And then they can think through, what are, OK, well, what are my options? This, uh, oh, is it feminine, masculine? They can go through those mental gymnastics. But it actually helps them. It's the system. Right? When you work on a systems level, it actually, in my experience, helps with accuracy in the long run. And the, the other thing it helps with, um, for, for beginners, because this is a very easy grammatical structure, uh, beginners don't have a lot of adjectives. They have a lot of nouns. So once they realize, oh, any noun in French can be used as an adjective, that expands their kind of communicative ability a lot. So, that's also one of the benefits of teaching them things, something like that. They can start saying things that are meaningful and kind of fun. Yeah, who are you? Well, I'm really into this. I'm really into that. You know, and they, they can talk about themselves in that way right from the start. Okay. So, can I add something in, yeah. in talking back to assessment? Because you mentioned the AP, and I was thinking um, proficiency came up a lot yesterday. 
if you think of um, standardized proficiency exams like the Actful OPI or um, the one I know best is the Goethe exam, which is the European Common Framework for German, but I think they're all quite similar in a lot of ways. Um, this kind of command actually would make someone come over as more proficient on a standard kind of oral proficiency exam. And that's one of the things that um, people are starting to realize is that we've said for a while, we'll get the students talking. That's what will make them proficient. And there's some more recent research that's going back and looking at recordings of uh, specifically the actable and looking at what kind of what, what are the students doing formally and is realizing that actually proficiency is largely a lot of formal command, not grammatical accuracy, but the ability to kind of creatively make choices between different forms. So maybe we undersold um, how important this kind of attention to form is um, in the early waves of the proficiency movement. Right. Right. And we know that accuracy comes after, right? No matter what, it takes longer <laughs> to gain accuracy than it does to be able to at least get your thoughts out in some fashion. So, so you know, accepting that as, as part of the reality, but then allowing them a much greater range of communicative ability is, uh, is I think, quite uh, a, a productive uh, goal. Chantal and I put together um, some thoughts um, about assessment that would tie in things that, we've, that, that we do that tie into, let's say, flight uh, kinds of lessons. And I guess one of the things, I mean, some, uh, some of it is quite obvious. I guess one of the things that, I, that I'd like you to focus on, you're gonna, I'm going to ask you to read just the first three pages, because those tie into um, the Hemingway lesson that I uh, uh, put together. So this is you know, sort of first year level or introductory levels, the lower levels. Um, and one thing I want you to think about is many people have mentioned rubrics. And uh, my question is, what kind of rubric <laughs> uh, might you need? Because yes, rubrics are a very uh, um, effective way of now of assessing. What kind of rubric might you need in order to properly or effectively assess uh, the kind of writing that involves the literary? Let's say. Um cannot be measured very easy, you can use the holistic approach of rubric. Otherwise, no, no, the analytical, if we have, let's say, definite areas mm -hmm. to be assessed. If not, we can use the, uh, the holistic rubric. OK, so you're going to see an example in here of yeah. what I did for the, the Hemingway text. But I'll ask you to just read the first three pages, and then we, we can uh, see how that may um, helpfully uh, help you to better understand how you could tweak or create rubrics that would fit uh, flight lessons.